Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the gathering of your precious people. We bless you for this worship experience. We thank you for allowing us to be in this place, calling on your holy and your righteous name. And Father, now we need to hear the word of God. Father, this is always serious business for me. God, I always feel the weight and the burden of proclaiming your word. I feel the responsibility, oh God, of proclaiming your word. But Father, I do trust in you and I'm confident in you because you want your people to hear your heart and hear the word of the living God. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that your people would lay aside any distractions and anything that would keep them from being attentive to the word of God. Father, we pray that the spirit of the living God will move through this place, touching hearts, touching minds and souls, and opening eyes, God, softening hearts. Helping us, Father, to be introspective, even as the word is going forth. Father, we trust that this word is going to be powerful and persuasive and productive. To the glory and honor of your name. Father, work in me this day. Move in me this day. I ask even now that you will lay your hand upon me. And that you would keep your hand upon me every second that I'm before the people and before you proclaiming the word of God. For I need you. I must have you, God, moving and working and operating if I'm to deliver the word of God. And I trust in you. For you are the true and the living God. You are high and lifted up. So we look to you today and we ask that you'll speak to us and help us to hear and we'll give you glory. Father, we ask all these things in the glorious name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Let God's precious people say amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, our God. Today's title is a question. Why is the church so weak? Why is the church so weak? I'm not in a rush. I want to make sure that we are together that we are together, that we are together in this space at this time and that we are looking to the Lord to speak. Why is the church so weak? You are familiar with the State of the Union address whereby the President of the United States will come before the nation and give his assessment of the state of the union, of the nation. And I think that's a great idea, that the leader of the country would come before the American people and give his assessment of the state of the union. But I believe it's also important for your pastor to come before the congregation and give his assessment as to the state of this church. It's beneficial to come before God's people and and you need to hear from your pastor what I believe is the state of the church. And, And really this is not the time to place a positive spin on things. This is the time to tell the truth. I have found that oftentimes we are uncomfortable with the truth. But the reality is it's the truth the knowledge of that truth that sets us free. So I'm not here 
to beat anyone up. But I'm not here to flatter us. I'm not here to lie to us. I'm here to look at us through the lens or the filter of God's holy and divine word. Why is the church so weak? When I ponder that, I, I couldn't help but think of Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And, and I realized that the Lord is speaking to believers, those who should be following him. He said, we are the salt of the earth. A salt should keep things from decaying, from seeing corruption. And I thought about the church, and I, I thought about that particular assertion and declaration. We are the salt of the earth. We are also the light of the world. We should actually nullify darkness because of the light that we put off in and through and by Christ. And we should let our light so shine before others that they will see our good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. So I pondered Matthew 5, 13 through 16, and, and I, asked to ask myself, I had to ask myself the question, how are we doing as we look at that short passage? And I came back to the question, why is the church so weak? So, so let's ponder that some. And sort of keep it in the back of your mind, but I want us to ask and answer the question, why is the church so weak? First of all, we can hardly get any consistency with respect to the holy huddle. We can't maintain momentum with the holy huddle. Now, I heard of the Holy Huddle from Bishop Jake some years ago when he was doing some teaching on leadership and church life. And he was talking about when we gather together in the name of Jesus, primarily on Sunday, also on Wednesday. But when we come together, we are coming together for a Holy Huddle. The people of God come together. If you know sports at all, you know what the huddle is. The huddle is the place where you hear the leader, the quarterback, call the play, ready, break. Now it's time to execute once we leave the huddle. So Jake spoke of a holy huddle and how the people of God should come together, hear from God's appointed leader. The leader calls the play as God gives the play. Now it's time to execute. But the problem is we can hardly have momentum and consistency with the holy huddle because we have so many missing from the holy huddle on a regular basis. It is difficult to have consistency when there's in and out, hit and miss. Why is the church so weak? We can hardly maintain momentum with the holy huddle. And the word really does address this. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we find the writer of Hebrews saying, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't stop coming together as the people of God. And you need to understand that the reason why the writer wrote that is because some folks within the faith community were no longer coming together on a regular basis. So the writer said, please don't forsake assembling together. You need to come together. And what was happening at that time, the people of God were being persecuted for their faith. They were going through some difficult times and facing affliction. So you know how sometimes folks do it. Folks say, well, okay, I guess I'm going to stay away from the house of God. When I reach out to folks who haven't seen in a while and I say, what's going on? Well, I, I'm going through some things and so I'm trying to spend some time in isolation with God. I'm just trying to get before the Lord. You show me any place in scripture that says that your salvation is to be lived out and walked out and worked out in isolation apart from the body. See, we, we are Western in our thinking. And we think about the individual. This is an Eastern book. And it talks about the corporate identity. It talks about the community. There is no true salvation in isolation. It must be lived out within the context of the faith community. But we say, well, I, I'm, I'm going through some things, Pastor, and so I, I'm just really trying to get before the Lord. I'm, I, I say, I doubt that. I, I doubt that you're really getting before the Lord if you don't want to assemble with God's people. See, the writer of Hebrews said, don't stop coming together. Come together and encourage one another. 
See, your mindset needs to change. Now, you know, we've seen this, at least I have, on television, and perhaps you heard about it, perhaps you've experienced it firsthand. But you remember how if there was ever some trouble in the neighborhood, and let's say one person, two, three, four, five people got behind you, and they're chasing you, and you know that your life is in danger, what did you do? If you, your thinking was, if I can just get to the house, I got four brothers and a tough sister. If I can just get to the house, if I can just get the home base, I won't need to fight by myself. <laughs> I'll have some help if I can just get to the house. So we need to have that same mentality. If you are going through some things, have the mentality, if I can just get to the house of God, I have some brothers and some sisters who will fight with me, who will help me win this battle. But why is the church so weak? Because we feel that now is the time to stay away from the house. And well, you know, I don't need to really come to church anyway because I can go down by the water and I can just give God some praise down there. Well, I doubt that you will. You might be drinking at the water. You might be smoking at the water and by the water. We like to say, well, I can actually serve God. Anytime you have to try to defend the fact that you don't want to come together with God's people, something is wrong. Let's just tell the truth. There was a precious sister on social media who put up a post and said, I, I believe in God, but I don't come to church. So people put nice things to encourage, amen, it's just only thing that matters that you love the Lord, that you believe in God, amen, praise God. And so I don't like to start trouble. Y'all might not know that about me. Sister Christine, I don't like, really like to start trouble, so, so I didn't want to post on her wall. So I went to the inbox. I went to the inbox. I, I went to message. I said, God bless you, sis. I saw your post, and I didn't, really didn't want to post on your wall, but let me just be clear about what you said. You said you believe in God, but you don't come to church. Well, I want you to know that in the book of James, it says that demons believe and tremble. And they don't have a relationship with God just because they so-called believe. I said, so you need to determine why it is you don't come to church. And I'm not trying to come at you. I'm being pastoral. God bless you. Now, of course, I didn't get a response. But I don't think they mad at me. Because they did like one of my subsequent posts. So... So, I, I was trying to tell the truth. We need to stop lying to ourselves. Well, I don't need to go to church. Yes, you do. This walk with the Lord is hard. It, it, it is hard. Sometimes we have to say, look, if I can just get to the house, something will be said, something will be done that will strengthen me and encourage me and keep me moving in the right direction if I can just get to the house. Now, now, I don't know if you intend to watch John Wick 3. I don't know. I didn't plan to say this. I didn't write it. But when I was watching that movie over this weekend, it was a powerful movie. And, I, and by the way, I think it's going to be a John Wick 4, the way it ended. But I noticed that when John Wick was running for his life, he, he was trying to get to a place, and he fell out on the sidewalk, and he touched the bottom of the step. Didn't he do it? He touched the bottom of the step. And because his hand was on the step, that was the safety zone. The man that was pursuing him was standing right there. He said, but I'm looking right at him, but here he is. No, 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 no. Back up. He made it to the house. And that's how we need to see things. If I can just get to the house. And then stand at the threshold and say, I wish you would come up in here. I wish you would come up in here. I have something for you. Me and my whole family. We love the fight, and we don't want a fair one either. We, we don't want a fair one. We know you asked for a fair one in the street. No, we don't want a fair one. If one fight, we all fight. That's how we do it. Come to the house. Come to the house and get strengthened. Come to the house and be encouraged. Come to the house and be blessed. Know that God says that you can just make it to the house. You'll find what you need. 
to keep moving in the right direction. Whew. I got a ways to go. But guess what? I ain't going to rush. I tell you that. Now, <laughs> Hebrews 10.25, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There's another reason. See, we need to encourage each other as we're getting beat down in life. But there's another reason. See, when you come together on a regular basis, you get to know the folk you worship with. See, now you have an opportunity to actually build genuine relationships, Deacon. See, now there's a relationship that I have with you. So now not only can you encourage me when I'm going through, but when I bump my head and I'm doing wrong because of the relationship, you, you can say some things to me. I might not appreciate it, but we have relationship. You might have hurt my feelings with what you said, but there's a relationship. See, when you have a relationship with somebody, anything can be said that needs to be said. And sometimes we ought to say the relationship is weak when you refuse to say what should be said. But you need to have the relationship and it's forged by coming together on a regular basis again that you know one another. And then as you have those connections, folk can begin to question you and ask you, what are you doing? Well, you really can't question me. Yes, I can question you. What are you doing? And why are you doing it? Does God get the glory from what you're doing and what you're saying when there are relationships? Why is the church so weak because we're not operating on optimal strength as it relates to each one doing what they supposed to do in first peter chapter 4 verse 10 each of you shall use whatever gift you have received to serve others as stewards of the manifold grace of god see god gives grace to us and in and through and by that grace comes gifts we don't deserve it none of us can brag and be prideful about the gifts God gave us we received it from God through grace through charis charis grace charismatic gifts it's, it's grace gifts God gave it to us but then we're told to serve others with those gifts as stewards of the manifold grace of God or the multifaceted grace of God or grace in its various forms. God wants us to be stewards. You must be faithful as a steward. And guess what is antithetical to being a faithful steward? Hitting and missing, coming every now and then, being here on a part-time basis. That is anything but faithful. And then I know some of you saying, because I know some of you slick, at least try to be, well, I'm just going to come on the Sunday when I'm responsible for doing something. But if I'm not on the program, if I don't need to do anything, then I'm going to wherever I want to go because I'm growing. You can't tell me anything. I've been growing for many years now. So if I want to go somewhere else, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'll be back when it's time for me to do something. No, that's not what we're talking about. That's not being faithful. Because all you care about is your little role. But what about the whole church? Each of us receive the gift by God's grace. And you should not leave the church wondering. Pastor H.B. Charles Jr. said, you can be gifted, but we don't want to stand around wondering if you're going to show up with your gift. We don't want to be standing there talking about, oh my goodness, if brother so-and-so get here, oh my, oh they are gifted. Sister so-and-so, truly anointed by God. If she shows up, it's going to be something. I don't know if she's going to show up, but if she shows up, it's going to be something. Oh, glory to God. Oh, if she gets here, if he gets here, oh, my, we in for a treat if they happen to show up. No, God gave us a gift or gifts through his grace. And he expects us to use that gift or gifts to serve others. And we need to be stewards of the grace of God. So as a steward, God's going to ask us how did we treat or do with the gift. What did we do with the gift that he gave us? He's going to ask us. He's going to call us on the carpet. You might not want to be called on the carpet now. But one day you will be called on the carpet. I will be called on the carpet. God wants to assess our stewardship. As each one of us received the gift, use that gift to serve others. Okay, but you're not convinced. Okay. 
you're not convinced. So maybe I need to tell you about Ephesians 4, verse 11. It speaks of the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And we celebrate the fivefold ministry. Amen. Praise God. God bless your apostle. Amen. That's the prophet. And I'm not against honor, but I'm not just focused on honor. I, I'll say this. Let's honor the fivefold ministry if they're doing their work. How about that? Don't just call folk all these nice titles and put them in all these nice positions. Are they doing the work? See, verse 11 speaks to the fivefold ministry. Verse 12 says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, the fivefold ministry equipped the people of God, the layouts of God, the laity of God, and they do the work. But then as you come to verse 16 of Ephesians 4, now we clearly see Paul is talking about the entire body. He's talking about the church. He's saying, now we are growing and we're built up as each one does its part. Each one. Now, I'm just wondering, you have a body. You have various systems, different parts of your body. What would you be satisfied with, like, your body not working? What in your body would you be okay with not working or functioning? Would you be happy to say, well, I got about 55% of my body functioning, so I'm satisfied. No, no. The body is going to be what the body needs to be. Everybody needs to fulfill their role. I don't want my finger to curl up to where I can't use it. I want my pinky toe to get all stiff to where I can't hardly walk on it. No, I want every part of my body. I want my spleen in operation. I want my kidney, my liver, my heart, my lungs, everything. I want my skin to do right. I want my bones to stay strong. I want every part of my body functioning. But we are content overall to have a few parts of the body working and struggling and straining, almost ready to fall out. But other folks sitting around watching, amen, they're doing a great job. Amen, I ought to applaud your efforts. You're working mighty fine. But what about the role that you play? The church is at a disadvantage if everybody don't get in the game. Now, in football, there's 11 folk on the field at a time for a given team. You want it to be 11 against 11. You don't want 11 against 10. You don't want 11 against 9. If it's 11 against 9, those with 11 have the advantage. Why? Because there's some folks on the other side of the team, other team, that's not fulfilling their role. When you're not fulfilling the role, it weakens the body. Why is the church so weak? Because everybody won't get in the game. We got too many folks on the sidelines, on the injury reserve list. I got my feelings hurt six months ago, so I can't come to church. The pastor preached a word, and I think he was talking about me. I practiced in the mirror for nine months, and they still won't let me sing my solo in the choir. My little feelings are hurt. I don't think I can come to church. Get off the injured reserve list and get it back in the game and let God use you. So that the church can be strengthened. Why is the church so weak? Now, there's a connection. See, if you don't come to church much, if you're on a part-time basis, okay, I'll do it, Lord. Really? I should do it? Okay, Jesus. We're going to go through the miniature roster and we're going to put PT next to your name if you are a part-time member. You're going to get part-time benefits. And when you call me and ask me to come be by your bedside at the hospital for hours, I'm going to give you some part-time pastoral benefits. Because you're a part-time member. So, so every, every three times that you would have called me, call me once. J just one time. Because some of us are part-time. But notice, if we don't want to come to the house regularly, that normally means that you're not supporting the church financially on a regular basis. That's what it normally means. Because the idea is if I'm not here, then my money don't need to be here. I'm going to take my money to right where I am 
where I'm having a great time. Amen. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I'm going to take this money. I'm going to spend it over here, there, and everywhere. I'm not in church. Why should I support the church? So now the church is weakened financially because folks are always out. And they don't want to support the work of God. But you need to hear the word. Now, we are familiar with Malachi 3, verse 8. Don't pass out. Will a man rob God? Let me just tell you right now, and so that you can be at least somewhat comfortable. We're not going to raise an offering after the sermon. We're not. We're not. The next offering will be next week. Amen. Will a man rob God? See, oh well, see, that was put in by the preacher because the preacher trying to get an extra offering so he can get some more shoes and get a suit or, you know, get a car. That's why the preacher, no, 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 my name ain't Malachi. I didn't write it. The Lord had it put in his word. Will a man rob God? But, but can I encourage you to not start with verse 8? Can I encourage you to maybe perhaps look at verse 7 where the Lord speaks of how the people are constantly breaking his decrees and they're breaking the covenant and God said, return to me. Return to me. So then the question no doubt in their minds is, well, how shall we return? That's when the Lord says, will a man rob God? So then naturally they know what the Lord knew what was in their mind. Okay? How are we robbing you? Through tithes and offerings. Then the Lord said, and you're under a curse. You and the whole nation, you're, you're under a curse. See, we don't like to talk about this and, and we want to say, well, no, this is not applicable. You didn't understand that the Lord took a harsh stand towards his people, against his people, when they took the position that we don't need to follow your covenant and we don't need to support the house of God. The reality is we need to bring the tithes, the whole tithe, into the house and the offerings. Why? So there's meat in God's house. So there's food in God's house. A while ago, a good while ago, somebody came to the church and said, well, I'm having trouble with my rent. So we got together, we had a quick discussion, and we went on and supported. Now the person said, um, Pastor, I want to pay this back. I said, well, we don't, we don't do loans. We're, we're not the bank. We don't do loans. If we can help, we're going to help. I said, now, what you can do is pay your tithes. Now, why did I say that? Was I being messy? No, I am being real. The reason why we have a check to give you, to keep you from being evicted, because folks brought the tithes and the offerings in the house. They brought it in the house. And because they brought it in the house, now we have something to do ministry with because folks brought it in the house. If it's not in the house, we can't do anything with it. If, if you bring a concern, well, amen, I, I, I pray for you, praise God, but the folks aren't bringing it to the house. But if it's in the house and it's a legitimate concern, we know what to do. So we need to understand that God expects us to support the work of ministry. Now, this might not be conventional to you, but I'm going to put a, a plug. I'm coming to Haggai in a minute, but I'm going to put a plug right here. I'm going to step over to my left and insert something behind 1 Peter 4.10 and Ephesians 4, 11, 12, and 16. Sometimes folks can't use their gifts because they don't know what their gifts are. I just backtrack. They don't know what the gifts are. They have no idea what their gifts are. But let me suggest this to you. We actually ask you to take a spiritual gift assessment. You don't want to take it. But then some of you don't know what your gifts are. If you actually take the assessment, we can sit with you. We can read it. We can interpret it. We can actually interview you. And we can help you to see what God is calling you to do. We want to help you know what gifts you have. So please, when we send it out again, if you have not taken the spiritual gifts assessment, please take it, especially if you don't know what God has called you to do. Now, please permit me to slide back over here. I've dealt with Malachi. Now I want to go to Haggai. Why is the church so weak? Haggai has two chapters, and I want to give a, a basic summary of Haggai. Now, now God sent his people, his covenant people into exile. 
into Babylon. And this was a difficult thing for God's people to deal with. The reality is, they, in Psalm 137, they spoke of how, you know, how can we sing when we're in a strange land? They were brokenhearted that God will leave them like that. But God told them, you're here because of your sinfulness. But they were in exile in Babylon. But then God allowed them to come back home and rebuild the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. But by this time, the folks were so comfortable in Babylon. They, they were very comfortable in Babylon. Many did not even come back to Jerusalem. The Lord touched Cyrus. The word says the Lord's anointed Cyrus. He said, come back and rebuild the house of God. Folks were so comfortable living in accordance to their own agenda in Babylon, in a place that was captivity, and they refused to leave Babylon. They stayed there, and just a remnant came back to Jerusalem to build the house of God. So the people started building, but they became disinterested. So that's when God touched the prophet Haggai and said, is it time for you to focus on your house for you to live in luxury and you to have what you need and the house of God lay in ruins. Consider your ways. Now, see, some might think that Haggai is about raising an offering. That's not what it's about. It's about priorities. Haggai is about priorities. Notice, is in Haggai 1 around verses 3 through 5, is it time for you to live in your own homes, have paneled homes, have what you need in your house, and not have any regard for God's house. See, the reason why the prophet had to say that because the people say, it's not time to deal with God's house, but I will focus on mine. And this is what I found through observation. We have the ability, I'll say the uncanny ability, I'll say almost miraculous ability, to find money for the things that we want to do to indulge on ourselves. Can I get about 14 witnesses? We find money. I'm like, show me that trick. Just, you just doing it and just doing it big. Just, hey man, you just, I mean, I ain't mad at you for just having a good time. I'm just saying, isn't it amazing that you can find all kind of stuff for your house, for your crib, for your domicile? You, you can find all kind of money to go all over here and there on the four corners of the earth. You all over the place just having a good time, white sand and beaches. I, I ain't mad at you about that. But we have money for all our stuff. And we're going to give the Lord just, amen, I'm, I'm going to bring this little bit to the house, amen. I'm, and, and you better be satisfied with it. What? Who you, first of all, who you think you're talking to? That, that's the first thing. It is not like you're really doing the house a favor to want to support the ministry. It, it's first of all about you and God and your relationship with God and your understanding of what it takes to run the ministry. That's the first thing. So let's not think in our minds, well, you ought to be happy. I'm going to give you this little something. See, you might say, that's all I have, Pastor, just a little something. But even when you have a little something, it can go a long way. Because if seven folks say, I don't have much, I won't give. But those seven turn around and say, I will give what I have. That can accumulate. And now we can do more ministry. We want food or meat in the house. And, and not just metaphorically, but literally. We have folk at times who need our pantry. And we need to be in a position to make sure that they have food. It's a horrible thing to need to eat and to want to eat and not have something to eat. So we must have what we need in the house so that when folks are in need, we can minister to them. So we need to understand that, that God is say, basically saying to us, you need to consider your priorities. See, and don't be wondering why some things at times are not working in your own life. Look at what you're doing or not doing as it relates to the church. Now, I want to say this again. I want God's people to enjoy themselves 
and this place and that place. And you can go on trips and vacations. By all means, go and have the greatest time you can have. I mean that. But all I'm saying is let's not neglect the house of God. Why is the church so weak? Because now so many are not even really interested in supporting the work of the ministry. If you can't say amen, say ouch. If you can't say amen, at least say ouch. Why is the church so weak? Because we have not conformed to Romans 12 too. And see, some of you are saying, what is Romans 12 too? I'll deal with that later on. Do not conform. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, the word says we should not be conformed to this world. J.B. Phillips says, do not allow the world to press you into its mold. But the reality is the world has more of an impact on the church than the church have an impact on the world. And, and that's, that is a shame. We ought to be, as I said earlier, light and salt. But the reality is the world is, is actually exerting influence on the church to where the church is trying to be in lockstep with the world over against God and his word. So why is the church so weak? We're not embracing Romans 12 too. But we're allowing the world to press us into its mold. Now we allow the world to tell us what is right and what is wrong. Now, if you want to plant your feet and say, I'm going to stand on God's word, now you are intolerant. Like, what is wrong with you? Now that which is wrong it is trying to win the day, and they want us to celebrate all that foolishness that God said is sin. And if we speak out against it, now there's something wrong with us. But the problem is, we're not truly speaking out against it, but we're going with the flow of the world. And we're saying, well, we, no, really, let's just do what, I mean, do understand that. I mean, God he really can't expect what well, I think he can expect us if he said to do it or not do it. Well, can God really? Yes, God can. But we allow ourselves to be pressed into the mold of the world. Let's turn some air on, please. We allow ourselves to get pressed into the mold of this world. See, Romans 12, 2 was not some new thing or idea. The reality is, even in Leviticus 18, 3, God said, and speaking through Moses, said, listen, I don't want you to do the things that they used to do in Egypt, and I don't want you to do the things that they're doing in the land of Canaan. Do not imitate them. Do not practice what they do. So even then, God was making it clear, you must be different from those around you. But how can we truly minister to the folks around us? How can we minister to the world when we actually look like the world? Now, at the men's ministry on Saturday, one of the brothers, Brother JC, said that a while ago, someone said to him, why should I go to church when there's no difference between the church and the world? He said, I hurt my feelings for that to be said. But let's assess it. Do we look too much like the world? Are we adopting the same positions as the world? Are we doing the same things that the world does when they, we want to unwind and relax? Are we going to the same places the world go to when we want to have so-called fun? Well, how is there any difference then? Why is the church so weak? Because you look like the world rather than the church. But the Lord said that we need to make sure that we're not conformed to this world. Stop allowing the world to press us into its mold. Let's influence the world rather than having the world influence us. Why is the church so weak? Why is a church so weak? Because we have lost sight of our primary mission. Found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Now we know this is called the Great Commission. Now we understand that we're supposed to go out and make disciples. 
of other nations, right? We're supposed to make disciples. But how can we make disciples of other nations when so many in the church are not disciples themselves? I'm going to let you ponder that for a second. How can we actually go make disciples when so many of us in the church are not disciples? See, a disciple is one who is disciplined and one who follows a teacher or a teaching and or a teaching. So, so if we are disciples, we are disciplined and following the Lord Jesus Christ and his teachings. But how... how but how can we really be disciples when we don't follow the Lord Jesus Christ? We want to really do what we want to do, and it does not matter what the Lord says. See, we want to live in accordance to our own agenda. And folks will tell you quickly, you can't tell me what to do, Pastor. Well, I'm trying to point you to what the Word of God says. I mean, I'm hoping that at some point you will just begin to believe that God's Word has value to it. But some folks just don't want to be told much. But how can we make disciples if we're not disciples ourselves? We refuse, many of us, to live a cruciformed life. A life that is shaped by the cross. A life that is shaped by the fact that Jesus was crucified and we were crucified in him. Galatians 2.20 lets us know that I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the word. So we ought to live a cruciform life, not living according to our own agenda, but let's live through and by the power of the cross. When we were crucified with Christ, that means we were put to death. When Jesus got up, we got up too through resurrection power to newness of life. Now we should not live for ourselves. How can we make disciples if we're not truly disciples? How can we really teach folks to observe what the Lord said and what he taught? And how can we teach folks to observe the commandments of the Lord if we don't observe the commandments of the Lord? There was a problem with that. We can hardly fulfill the mission of the church because the mission of the church ought to be a mission to the church first. And then we might be in a position to go out and minister to the world. We need to get folks truly saved right now in this church. Jonathan Networth spoke of conversion. See, and he saw it, and I understand where he was coming from. He saw it differently than salvation. I don't want to say mere salvation, because if you're truly saved, then conversion is part of it. See, but we are content with saying, I'm saved, amen, in Jesus' name, I'm saved. And then you want to say the same. I want to say the same. But conversion means, now that I am saved, now I'm going to live differently because I am saved. My life has been converted. It's been changed from what it was. Now it's something new. Because I have been converted. So we are not as strong as we need to be because we have so many people who are not disciples. How then can we make disciples in the world if many of us are not disciples? All right. So you're saying, well, Pastor, I, I want to challenge that last assertion that many of us are not disciples. I, I, I want to I challenge that. I, I don't know how you can actually really make that claim and I, I think you need to back that up some kind of way. I mean, I'm just letting you know, Pastor, because you can't just be saying some stuff and you can't back it up. Okay. All right. On social media not too long ago, I, I saw where a person was criticizing President Obama, or not criticizing, but I guess he was, but he had every right to do that because he can say what he wants to say, but he was saying he had a problem with the fact that Obama said that we're not a Christian nation. Now, I understood, the person who offered that criticism, I understood where they're coming from. You know, to, to have, have, to feel some kind of way because President Obama, when he was a president, said we're not a Christian nation. I can understand why he, well, feels some kind of way. But I believe I also understood what President Obama was saying. He was speaking, I think, in inclusive terms. But I do understand that historically speaking, we want to be seen as a Christian nation, even on our money, in God we trust. 
But I was put on that money a long time ago. And even then, I don't believe we can really call ourselves a Christian nation even then. But all that was going on even then. But I, I know that folk want to think that this is a Christian nation. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't Christians in the nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But is the Lord the God of this nation? And I don't think so because if you look at our policies and how we spend money, you look at our budgets, we're not following the Lord. And you go ahead and plant your feet and say something about Jesus. You will be a pariah, an outcast in society. Why? Because if this is a Christian nation, we ought to be able to say, the Bible says. But you go ahead and stand up in Congress and say something about the Bible says. You stand up in the public square and say, thus saith the Lord. If this is truly a Christian nation, we ought to be able to plant our feet and proclaim Jesus. But we can't do that. This is not a Christian nation. But the reality is, see, there's skepticism all over the place. Folks don't believe that the Bible's valid. Folks don't believe that Jesus truly got up from the grave. And this is a Christian nation. Folks want to know from us, tell me why you believe what you believe. So now I'm coming to the part to show you that I believe that many of us are not disciples. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to be ready to give an answer, a response to those who ask us for the reason for our hope. Why do you hope in Jesus? How many can really give a reason? What if somebody came into your face and got in your face and, and barked out, Jesus was not resurrected bodily? What would you say? Would there be any response? See, 1 Peter 3.15 is calling Christians to be apologists. And that does not mean apologize for what you believe. It comes from apologia, which means a defense. You say, all oh, that foolishness that you want, I'm going to defend the faith. But are we in a position to defend the faith that we say we believe? Well, I don't believe the ballot is, Bible is valid. Well, what do you say? Is there anything that you can say besides, yes, it is. It is valid. Because I, I remember the scripture, Jesus wept. And I felt something when I said it. Jesus wept. How are you doing, beloved? Disciple. As an apologist, can you answer any objections to the faith? Do you study and read enough to actually give a cogent, clear, powerful, persuasive answer when the scoffers come to tell us our faith is meaningless? That's part of your discipleship. Amen. To be ready and willing to give an answer. Why? Is the church so weak? Because when we're not in place on a regular basis, we can't get the benefits that we see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. We don't get the benefits of that. See, Paul says, him we preach or proclaim with wisdom and admonishing others. Why? So we can present you fully mature in Christ. The point of the preaching is to actually help you to come to maturity in Christ. But if you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in and out. How can you be exposed then to the word for your growth and maturity? Now, I want to say this. This, this is just how I feel, and I'm, I'll say it in a good way. I put in a lot of time each week on these sermons. Each week. And I'm thinking about some of you. I'm praying and God is dropping some of you in my spirit. So I'm crafting these, these sermons to come and bless you, to help you to grow. And then I get here and the people that need it are not here. Why? Because PT is going to be put next to the name soon enough. On the roster, part-time. In and out. 
in and out. The message is crafted. And I don't know how you feel, but I don't ever want to miss a good meal. You fix it, I'll be there. But a lot of time, and I'm not saying this in a self-serving man. I'm just being sincere and transparent. I put a lot of time in this. Reading and stuff. Even now, I've started studying for sermons I'm going to preach in August. Because I need to do it right. I need to make sure that I'm effective and accurate. I'm trying to mature you in Christ. But if you're constantly out somewhere else, how then can you get the word? Now, well, Pastor, I'm going to go back later and watch it um, on the website for the church. Hey, amen. There's a difference. When we go to Hampton and we talk about how great a, a sermon was or what, whatever, and we're right there in the environment, feeling the power of God, it is different from when we bring the video back and say, okay, watch this. You sit in your living room and you put the DVD in or whatever, or you listen in. It's not the same thing being there as the Spirit of God is moving in the place. So why is the church so weak? Because we don't want to expose ourselves to consistent preaching and teaching. Now you say, okay, but pastor, I'm, I'm pretty mature in the Lord. Some of you are. But even, have you noticed in mixed martial arts and other disciplines, they have coaches. And honestly, to be, I was thinking about St. George Pierre one time, and he was great when he was fighting. And he would have a jujitsu coach. I'm thinking, so if they actually had a, a, a match, who would win? I'm sure, I'm thinking I'm sure, that St. George will win. Yet he has a coach. See, while George is in there fighting, the coach is able to watch what's going on. Sometimes George is not even aware of some things because he's in the midst of the battle. But the coach is on the outside of the ring looking. So when you come back to the corner, say, listen, this is what you need to do. Stop dropping your left. Put your right up. Why? Because the coach can show you some things that you're not even aware of. So you might be mature, praise God, but you still have some growing to do. I might be mature, but I have a whole lot of growing to do. But when you come here and hear the word of God, it helps you to grow and to mature and be all that God will have us to be. Now, if everybody kept exposing themselves to the word, not just to hear it, but to be transformed by it and to do it, that right there will strengthen the church. If we would come and be exposed to the word of God. Now, I've been moving in the interrogative. Why is the church so weak? Let me move now to the declarative. We will be weak no more. We will be weak no more. We will be weak no more. Now, how can I say that? By putting a few things before you. I want you to really give serious thought to this. Are you personally adding to the strength? Are you contributing to the strength of the church or the weakness of the church? Go ahead, I'll wait. Think about it. You heard the message. Are you contributing to the strength of the church or the weakness of the church? Be real. Are you contributing to the strength of the church or the weakness of the church. If you say, well, honestly, I've been contributing to the weakness of the church, why not commit right now to make a change? Why, why not commit right now? Now, I don't know how you feel, but I, I, I couldn't live with myself if I was contributing to the weakness of the church. I wouldn't know, okay, what, what can I do See, and sometimes as I'm preaching the word, there, there obviously is some distance. And you're able to, you know, you, you can move and you can, you can duck some of the word. You know, you can duck some of the word because you're out there and I'm over here. But what you need to do is get an accountability partner. Somebody that you can give permission to. To look you dead in your eye. Both of them. And say you are out of line. You're out of order. You need to get right. You moved outside of the will of God. We need that. 
Hear that. Hear that in your spirit. Hear that in your spirit. Hear that in your spirit. Each of us need an accountability partner that can tell us the truth. That's not there to flatter us. That's not there to co-sign our mess. But to tell us the truth. See, we want to go ask all kind of folks some stuff until we get the answer we want. No, find an accountability partner that you know love you and that you love and that you can respect. And then let them speak truthfully into your life. And if they say, beloved, you know I love you, but you're wrong. But, 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 beloved, I love you, but you're wrong. But, but, but the word says, but, but, an accountability partner. If you have one, that person can speak into your life. I remember, I still have this friend. In fact, by the grace of God, he's a pastor, but I serve as his pastor. But about maybe almost 30 years ago, a little something was going on, and, and he called me, because we just real, and he called me up. I think I called him. I called him and asked him, hey, bro, let me ask you this question. Does it seem strange? And I told him what the situation was. He said, boy. Have you lost your mind? And he's ready to take action right then. I said, I got my answer. I'm going to take care of it right now. But the point is, there was no preachers. Well, well, let me say what might sound like. Mm -mm. You need an accountability partner that's going to snatch you from some things sometimes. And be able to ask you, have you lost your mind? Can I ask you, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? And then you have to answer. Have an accountability part. And then finally, for now, because there's a lot of things we can do, some of you, and I'm not saying this to your discredit, but some of you just don't know the word of God. You're just not biblically literate. You just don't know the word. How in the world can you help the church be strong by you doing your part if you really don't even know the word? Now, I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm not saying it for that reason. I'm saying too many of us don't really know the word. So uh, me and a few others are going to put together a nice exam. Yes, sir. We're going to do it, right? We're going to put together a nice exam, and we're going to give it to everybody. Not to embarrass you, but we want to know what of the word and the Christian life do you know and understand. And we're not going to use that as an occasion to laugh at you behind your back. We're not going to do that. But what we will do is put together curriculum and programs that try to increase your biblical literacy. Now, I will say this, and then I'm going to sit on down. I will say this. Some of the stuff that folk will say is, is downright funny and deserves some laughter. Years ago, we had the test, and we were in the fellowship hall, and he wasn't a member. I don't know where he was or where he came from, but he was here that Wednesday. So he took the test. So I'm sitting there as people brought the test up. I'm sitting there actually you know, grading it, giving it right back to him as he stood there. So one of the questions was, who killed Abel? Who killed Abel? And uh, it was multiple choice. This blessed young man, he circled the serpent. <laughs> the serpent. Now, I like to be dignified when I can. It was very hard to not bust out laughing. I was holding in, brother. I was like, <clears throat> Uh, no, it wasn't the serpent. Amen. It, it wasn't the serpent. Now, you might think that's crazy, but you might have picked the serpent. It's not about laughing at folk, but the point is, there's a lot about the word we don't know. So we're going to remedy that. Because we don't need to be a weak church. We need to be a strong church. <laughs> weak and church should not even go together. But let's make sure we're doing all we can in the upcoming months to make sure that we move from a position of weakness to strength. So I don't have to preach this message again. Why is the church so weak as you rest on your feet?